Fletcher. He's a professor of theoretical and uh, world archaeology at the University of Sydney and the director of the Greater Inquor Project. Uh, over the past 30 years, Dr. Fletcher has made invaluable contributions to archaeological theory and method. Among his many fields of expertise are the philosophy of archaeology, the study of settlement growth and decline, and the analysis of large-scale cultural phenomena over time. Uh, in 1995, he wrote a, a well-received, path-breaking volume called The Limits of Settlement Growth, a theoretical outline and analysis of the past 15,000 years of settlement history with Cambridge University Press. Uh, he's a self-proclaimed electric radical theorist. You should all be that, right? And, uh, oh, you don't have to be, no. You have to be a good, you have to be good excavator. Sometimes, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Excavation first. Yeah. Have to, and, Absolutely. And has been directed to the Greater Angkor Project. Uh, and this multi-year investigation has really completely revolutionized our understanding of inquiry and ecology, political economy, and urbanization. And uh, Dr. Fletcher's research has significantly advanced many fields in archaeology from the study of proxemics, Settlement pattern, settlement pattern analysis, low density urbanism, mega cities, social collapse, ancient irrigation systems, past strategies of sustainable development. Uh, he's done really important work with lidar technology, and as you'll hear today, he's also <coughs> really some very interesting new theories on materiality. And so I don't want to take too much of your time. Just give you a sense. Uh, Ted Banning, who was planning to come to the talk this morning, wrote said, "I'm so disappointed. I'm going to be missing." Uh, Dr. Fletcher's lectures. I remember how much he inspired me in grad school. So you mm -hmm. mentioned proxemics. Yeah, that's useful. So. <laughs> so with no further ado, thank, thank you, you so much, much Roland. This is actually um, due to Andrew Harris. So if you like the talk, you should say thank you to him. If you don't, you should just say boo to him. And he's in transit that's too. In transit. So. <laughs> no, because we met him in Cambodia. I've just been at the SA. Barring this sort of strange interlude of weather running across the United States, it would be a lot easier to get here and get back. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is actually what the 1995 book, which is called The Limits of Settlement Growth, is really about. And that is the issue of how we analyze the relationship between sociality and materiality. And the term I've coined for the position that I'm arguing is material behavior. So material behavior as a phenomenon in its own right distinct from active behavior, which is us moving around and waving our arms in here. What we tend to do is we tend to see the material as a subsidiary or a reflection of sociality and action. The position I've been arguing, I've been arguing for a number of years, is that the material and the social do not correlate. They can do, but they commonly do not. And at a very large scale, this has some very serious implications for us. So my argument would be that rather than in the archaeological record, just looking for correlations between the material and the social, which may mismatch quite badly, what we should look at is the relationship between the material, the social, and the outcome of the relationship between those two. As I'll summarise at the end of this talk, the key point being that the archaeological record is a superb record of outcome. As somebody once facetiously remarked, everybody in the archaeological record is dead. So this is the basic point that I'm making. One of the reasons for really coming back to this was uh, Ian Hodder's recent book about entangling, interlinking of humans and the material. And the reason I've come back to it is that my argument is that we're not entangled with material record. It is impossible for us to get away from it. There is no disengagement. We are only human because of the material. There's simply no way of getting away from it. And there are innumerable ways in which we relate to it. The key issue about the material 
is that though we often think of it as just a service to what we do, it in fact always extracts a price. If, for instance, I'm not satisfied with the house I live in, I have to spend money on renovation in order to make the 19th century house I live in into a usable 21st century house. It costs almost a quarter of the mortgage value of the building. We don't get materiality for free. And the other, which we're acutely aware of, and I'll come back later, is of course if you're using plastics, plastics are tremendously convenient and a great help. We can throw away our plastics bags and now of course we're discovering where they will end up and the consequences that that has for us. So my point is that we can't get away from the material. It actually defines who we are as a being, as a biological being, and the material is both useful to us and extremely dangerous. Now one of the particular problems that the humanities have had is that on the whole they've been more interested in the small stuff. They've been interested in things like clothing, decorative items, probably getting up about to the level of the house and furniture and house contents. But what we have done persistently in most of the studies of materiality is we always want to convert the material into a verbal meaning. Status, quality, interrelationship, social rank, and so on. One of the points I want to illustrate is that words and material don't stick together. And that there are entire classes of material behaviour for which there is no word referent, and in fact, commonly, no articulated social referent. So one example of this is the really neat concept of object biographies. This is the point that an object goes through numerous roles in its existence, um, from being, for instance, brand new and shiny, to ultimately being a piece of garbage. The mistake in this definition about object biographies is about the accumulation of meaning. Meaning commonly doesn't accumulate on objects. What commonly happens is a new meaning is smeared over the top of the object. The object does not carry the verbal meaning. The verbal meaning is carried in the heads of the players with the stuff, not in the object itself. So the famous example is military medals. On the left is the Victoria Cross, on the right is the German Iron Cross. The Victoria Cross is a very well known medal, it's a very high status, but there are undoubtedly a couple of Victoria Crosses sitting in boxes in people's attics or in children's play boxes and they mean absolutely nothing. They're a piece of metal that's kind of fun, it jingles, but the original meanings associated with the fact of that metal being awarded have entirely disappeared. With something like the Iron Cross, the big complication you have is that this is a highly reputable award until May of 1945. And from 1945 onwards, it gets an overlay, which is in fact very unjust to the people, many of the people who won it, because they won it for the same sorts of reasons as people who won the Victoria Cross. But that meaning has overwhelmed, the new meaning has overwhelmed the other one. The other problem, but it's the problem the Victoria Cross, of course, is that any medal from anybody in any family commonly ends up in a play box and has no meaning to the child who plays with it other than that it's a curious, shiny object. It carries none of its inherent meaning of the bravery of the people to whom it was awarded. 
it's that disjunction, that's the critical phenomenon that's actually built into object biographies. It's not cumulative meaning, it's the loss of meaning, and that there is no simple connection between the material and the, and the social meaning. Now, the other part of this, and this is one of the things I was doing many years ago, is that there are entire classes of behavior in human beings for which there are no verbal reference. It is called non-verbal behavior. And the critical one, and it's the one that people are most familiar with, is the business of how far apart people sit. And if you want to see non-verbal meaning in action, get on to an almost completely empty bus very late at night and sit next to the only other person on the bus. <coughs> you will very swiftly discover what non-verbal meaning actually is. The key point is that these are motor behavior signals. They don't convert. If you ask people, what is the standard space and distance between human beings? It's something they stare at, you're all doing it today. Nobody could tell you. It simply isn't there in the articulated description of behavior. So the basis of this was the, the marvellous work of um, Edward Hall, and I strongly recommend you read this book, partially because it's really intriguing. Uh, E.T. Hall, was brought, as an anthropologist, was brought in by the State Department to work out why in the 1950s American diplomats weren't getting on with other people in the rest of the world. And the problem was that they were largely East Coast males from Ivy League institutions. And they kind of didn't understand that the Arabs and the Africans simply didn't behave the same way. And that was what E.T. Hall was analyzing. And one of the key things that comes out of this is that people in different cultures have different spacing configurations. Africans stand much closer together than Europeans tend to. But the really nice thing is that and somebody should do a PhD on this. This is what happens on a beach when we are in a purely recreational mode, we space ourselves with meticulous precision. There is a really obvious standard distribution there. And somebody should really take aerial photographs of beaches all over the world, check out whether the Japanese do it differently to the Arabs, do it differently to Australians, and so on. Nobody polices this, nobody manages it but you try putting your towel too close to somebody who doesn't know you. It will cause you psychological stress and it will cause them to react, which is not going to do. And the key thing about this is that no word form and no sociality in our sense of it is required at all because gorillas do it. In fact, all animals do it. So the marvellous thing about the gorillas is that the gorillas build campsites. You can see at the bottom some of these nests that they make. A guy called George Schaller mapped several of these camps. This is four different camps. You can measure the distances between these little circles of vegetation that the gorillas sleep inside. Then you can see that it's a highly consistent behavioral pattern. This is the distance between the, uh, the locations in the camps, and that's the frequency. This is highly patterned. And of course, if you look at human buildings, it's exactly the same. If you measure the distances, doorways, distance between, between posts and so on, you get this very distinct signal. There is no social meaning attached to that. There may be social meaning attached to the building. There's undoubtedly social meaning attached to these whack and great pillars. You know, this kind of thing that human beings have meaning attitudes about. But the actual metricality doesn't have a social meaning attached to it. You can also see, this is sort of the work I did at Del Medina in Egypt, you can also see if you plot the development of a building over time, or a set of buildings over time, you can actually see signal 
acted on. You can see signal accumulation very systematically. So this is highly patterned barrier. You can also see, and this is the other critical test that I did, that this is not to do with raw materials. This is not a function of the availability of materials because in the Guatabi in the southwest of the United States you have an extraordinary situation where you have a, an American Indian Pueblo and a Spanish mission in exactly the same place at exactly the same time. And when you plot up the metrical dimensions inside these buildings, that's what the mission looks like and that's what the Pueblo looks like. The minimal point is that the Pueblo is using branches for the roofing its rooms and the Spanish were using tree trunks. The raw materials do not define the metricality of the space. The metricality of the space is part of the behaviour of the group. But it doesn't directly connect in any obvious sense to the sociality of that group certainly to their identity, but not the particular dimensions. So the broad point that I want to make is that there is actually a non-correspondence. There's this whole mode of material form, which in various configurations is not coincident with the social system that is using it. A classic example of this is a very famous study by Parsons done in the 1940s. It's a very early piece of psychological research, in fact, where he went into a village of the Pueblo. This is the plan of the Pueblo. And he asked the men and the women to draw their map of what the Pueblo looked like. I cannot for the life of me remember which one of those is the males and the females, but one is males and one is females. And the key point is that this is something that we could have known in the 1940s and is really only a fashionable social phenomenon from the 70s and 80s onwards, is that there isn't a single coherent conception of the society or articulation of the society within the community. The women have a different view of the buildings from the men. Their perspective on what it is is not the same. So there isn't a situation where the materiality simply maps onto what the actors in that space perceive it to be. I think also of Toronto, if you ask somebody in West Toronto to draw a map of Toronto and somebody in East Toronto to draw a map, you get a different version. You've seen these things where you have the New York view of the world, where it's Times Square and it's very large and somewhere over there in the distance is a little tiny dot called San Francisco. There's an entirely different perspective. The materiality is actually different from the game that is going on, the social game that is going on in people's heads. My <coughs> favourite experience of this was actually living in a village in Ghana uh, of the Ashanti. The Ashanti are very unusual because this is a society which in old conventional terms is described as matrilineal. What that actually means is that the domestic grouping is a brother and sister, not a husband and wife. So these houses, each of these is a house, these houses are extremely tightly defined. They are closed and they have one narrow entrance. And the people who live in here are sisters and brothers and the sisters have their children with them. The husbands of those sisters are somebody else's brother. And those brothers live in another house. 
So this woman's husband is over here. And the effect of this is an absolutely amazing sight in the evening in the shanty villages where children run through the streets with pots of food on their head which this woman has cooked for her husband. And this woman has cooked for her husband. So food leaks in and out of the building. The sociality of the building leaks in all directions. And the spatiality would lead you as an archaeologist to say, this is a clearly defined, closed social entity. And it's nothing of the sort. It's nothing of the sort. You would expect a sister-brother configuration like this to have open spaces in all directions, but it doesn't at all. Now I want to move on to another aspect of materiality, having argued this disjunction case, which is simply to go through the scale over which materiality operates. We tend very much in archaeology, because of what we spend most of our time doing, focused on the relatively small. And that the very small social meaning is very, very I don't know whether you know this, but around the Uraeus on one of the coffins of Tutankhamun is a little wreath of flowers. And that wreath of flowers appears to have no formal role in the ritual of the burial of the roof. And one of the nice stories, and it doesn't have any background to it, but one of the nice stories is that this is a wreath placed around that ritual symbol by Tutankhamun's wife. That is probably not the case, but the point is it's very easy to articulate an emotional direct connection for that object to a human act. It's small, it's readily made, and it's a clear act that has produced that phenomenon. We actually have no idea why that thing is there. This is a very sad example of the direct articulation between small objects and sociality. This is a little metal plaque for a Jewish girl who was born in Amsterdam in 1937 and was gassed in the Sobibor extermination camp in Poland in 1942. And the only evidence that we have of her existence, we would never otherwise ever have asked about her, is this. This was provided at some point down the line by the people who are imprisoning her. And because we have her name, we have now gone back and the historian has found photographs of her, photographs of her with her family. She has been retrieved, she's been given life because of that object. So these small objects really do connect to social life. There's no question of that. You can do that kind of connection. This is one of my favorite images from Angkor. This is an apsara on um, the walls of Angkor Wat, who appears to have an iPhone. It's actually a flip book. This is the two halves of some kind of pad that are joined through the middle, and they've even done schematic lettering. I'm told that doesn't mean anything. But the crucial point about this is that many of the apsara on the walls of Angkor Wat have an individual marker. These are people. This isn't a standardized series of nearly 2,000 women. These are representations of particular individuals. One has a little dog, for example. Every one of them has a different mode of dress. This is socially extremely informative because what it appears to tell us 
is that these women, who are probably the, representing the dance troupe of Angkor Wat, were literate. And that literacy was actually quite high in the elite female sector of Khmer society, which we indirectly know from other inscriptions. But this is an actual physical indicator that that was the case. So again, notice the connection is quite strong. We then move up the scale a bit to one of my favourite icons, the little black dress. When you get to the little black dress, things start to become interesting because this is part of a suite of items, numerous, numerous examples. So you can see here the diversity of the little black dress, and if you go into magazines, you quite commonly see for any one year a display of all the designs of little black dresses for that year. So this is an example. What you realise, of course, is if you drew an axial line through these and you set a point for the neck, you can actually overlay all these, which my wife did because she was in the design industry. You get this. This is the variation inherent in the little <coughs> black dress. You could actually make a three-dimensional model out of this or you could analyse it in terms of the degree of variation. What you're beginning to see here is that in middle-sized objects, mobility objects, you start getting variability. We're very familiar with it in ceramics, for example. We have a relatively underdeveloped notion of variability in archaeology, which is rather curious because, of course, in biology, variability is the great issue because what's inherent in variability is the basis for change. But there is no social articulation for that phenomenon. There's a social articulation for whether you're wearing a very short black skirt or a very long one, but not for that pattern of variation. That is simply something that we do and it has no social articulation in itself. Then as you move further up the scale you get things like this. We get up into some pretty big stuff. This is the Bismarck wreck at the bottom of the Atlantic. We have gone from being an animal that made tools and helped them and to an animal that lives inside tools. We can make huge things. And when you go up to a really enormous scale, which I'll come back to again on the planetary scale, around our planet we have a vast material phenomenon, which is all the space junk, all the satellites, including much further out a whole lot of satellites apparently which we do not know about publicly. There are an enormous number of black satellites which are much further out. So we have actually created a garbage pattern around our planet. That's a really interesting piece of archaeology for somebody down the line. And there's a big issue because it's a discussion at the moment about hoovering all this stuff out of space because it's dangerous. It can smash into things that we're setting up. And a number of people have commented that the only record of those pieces of machinery, the only record of the space program, is up there. And in principle, if that's all hoovered up, it should really be hoovered up and parked somewhere. Whereas the preference is to hoover it up and dump it into low Earth orbit and burn it up in the planet's atmosphere. So there's a whole cultural heritage issue there to deal with. But there is actually no legislation on this planet for the regulation of that, or for instance of the heritage sites on the moon, like the first landing site. There's an enormous legislative problem. So we have materiality over 
many great scales. So let's now have a look at what this leads to as implications. And I'm going to use a number of examples from particularly from warfare in the cities and that culture. If you haven't read it, there is a book I would strongly recommend you read as archaeologists. It's called The Face of Battle by John Keegan. It's an analysis of three great battles. The usual thing you read a description of a battle and it's all who charges where and who does what. That's not what John Keegan is talking about. John Keegan is talking about what is it physically like to be in that battlefield? The noise levels, the mess, the inconvenience, how people are controlled, how communication works. It's really astonishing. And it goes from medieval battles through to the Battle of Waterloo and then ultimately to the Battle of the Somme. And the point, one of the points he's making in terms of sound, for example, is that in a medieval battle, the noise level was a little above the noise of a pub brawl. When you get to the Battle of Waterloo, it's getting noisy. When you get to the Battle of the Somme, the noise volumes on the battlefield exceed the noise volumes of an early industrial plant. They're just mind-shattering. The noise alone is almost incapacitating. It's that physicality. It's really an interesting study. And he made a very shocking observation about the First World War, which has an inverse social implication. This is the kind of landscape that was created by the early use of industrialized warfare. It created this horrific moment of soldiers having to go over the top of their trenches and out across open territory. That open space was swept by machine gun fire. And as you all realize, at this point, the defensive technology was overwhelming what the soldiers could do. So you have the terrible battles of 1916 where there are huge casualties. Now what is commonly assumed is that the problem is a social problem because the generals are of a different class and they're indifferent to the survival of their soldiers. They're indifferent to the survival of their soldiers in one sense, they're having to fight a war. And they have to fight. And they have to send their soldiers out to fight. The problem is this. That's one of the ways they're communicating. One of the other ways they're communicating is by flashing lights. And another way they're communicating which I find really disturbing, which Keegan points out, is that in the Battle of the Somme, when the attacking soldiers had reached an enemy line, the only way they had of telling anybody that they had got there was to wave a flag. What Keegan points out is that the men who were fighting those battles in 1916 are using the same communications technology as the Battle of Waterloo. The problem for the generals is that the materiality of communication hasn't caught up with the materiality of the technical systems, weapon systems of the battlefield. And these guys, guys like Ludendorff on the right, Haig on the left, who are the people who are fighting those big battles, managing those big battles in 1916, are the guys who in 1918 are operating highly mobile warfare using radio phones and tanks, which are the technologies which have been invented. The problem of the battles in the middle of the First World War 
is not a problem specifically of social fecklessness. It is a problem of communication technologies. The only way to fight in 1916 is to push huge numbers of soldiers out doing absolutely the same thing because that's the only way to control them. Nobody has any means of making any radio communication of the battle on song at all. So if you watch a, a marvellous series called Anzacs, when you get to the end of the Anzacs series, when the fighting is occurring in 1918, there are images of Australian soldiers on battlefields talking into radio phones in order to bring in artillery strikes. It's nothing like 1916 at all. So the point that comes out of Keegan is that the materiality of communication is extremely critical. The communication systems were completely out of synchrony with the industrialization of the society that was using them. Another example of this phenomenon, and it's something that's become a characteristic of modern warfare, is the materiality of the spaces in which we fight. Now just to give you a little bit of background, <coughs> this is about the Battle of Stalingrad. What people commonly don't understand about the Battle of Stalingrad is that if you follow that arrow, by the time the Germans got to Stalingrad, they had punched through the entirety of industrialized Russia. There was industrialization brought over here, but it was constrained beyond the Urals. But when the German army was at Stalingrad, the reason why it fought so furiously and why the Russians fought so furiously was that on the other side of the river, there was nothing. The Germans had literally broken through the entirety of the functioning portion of the Russian state. So the fighting was really vicious. It's a fight for a long, narrow town along the side of the Volga. The Volga is very wide at this point. And it comes down to battles for individual buildings, individual factories. And the Russians were ultimately driven back into these small zones along the edge of the river. The reason that they can hold on and take terrible casualties, but the reason they can fight and resist is this. This is what the fighting is inside. The fighting is inside a smashed up industrial city. And the junk, the smashed buildings, the wrecked workshops, the smashed up railway lines, piles of garbage, broken glass, tons of rebars is the drag, the inertia that enables the Russians to stop the German army. Right at the end. This is what it looked like. This is a really remarkable concept. It's quite normalized now in our modes of warfare. This is the <coughs> siege within the city. You use the materiality of the city as a weapon in its own right against an attacking force. Urban warfare is really awful. And this is a materiality that is becoming a phenomenon in its own right on the enormous scale. You move then across to cities. I'm going to speak about this fairly fast because it's what I'll talk about this afternoon. The illustration we use with Angkor is that the issue with Angkor is that Angkor is building infrastructure for water management on an industrial scale in the 12th century AD. These reservoirs here are each about 12 kilometers long. If you ever get the chance, you should go to Angkor. Don't bother about the temples, just go see the Barai. That's an aerial view of the West Barai. That is the shrine in the middle of the Barai that's four kilometers to the other end. The banks are 100 meters thick and 10 meters high. The 
represents 15 million cubic metres of dirt in that bank, and this is not a hole in the ground. This is a reservoir in an industrial sense built up above ground surface. What the Khmer had done was they had built themselves into a titanic, immovable material infrastructure. It was big channels running through it, and then it was hit by mega monsoons. Those monsoons, this is the ones that you see up here, are a third to twice as large as the ones which are occurring now. And what is pretty plain is that the channel systems couldn't carry that amount of water. So in the middle of Angkor, this is the main canal coming through central Angkor. That's it in more detail. This is a bridge just to the east of the centre of Angkor. Up there, you see that layer of stones? That is the original level of the canal. This is where the river now runs, which is three to five metres lower. So what has happened is that that level of water coming into the system has simply gouged out the canal from that ground level down to this current level. And you realise, of course, that once that happens, all the intakes and outtakes on either side of those canals are completely ruptured. What you're seeing here is a material infrastructure which is so massive that the water can't go anywhere other than straight down the system. And all it has done is ripped out the system. The sociality that depends upon that then breaks down. All that erosion goes down into the lower canals and this is several metres of sand completely filling the lower canals. So what happens in Angkor, this is the dating which I'll come back to this afternoon, it's all in the 14th century. This is the erosion down to here and this is the sand deposition. And the entire system of Angkor depends upon water being taken that way and this way. So once that happens, that entire system is ruptured. If they had used smaller systems and multiple reservoirs and many alternative channels, they wouldn't have landed in this situation. That materiality in itself, that material infrastructure, is a threat to the integrity of the society. The instance in our world, which has been remarked on relatively recently, is of course the New York underground system. If the water level rises a relatively small amount or you have a gigantic surge, the big risk in New York is that the entire underground system will flood. If it floods, it will be very hard to resurrect. The amount of damage that that would cause would be titanic and the entire transport system of New York would be broken because that central node would fail. Cities in themselves actually become dangerous. The famous example in ancient history is Imperial Rome. There's all the facetious nonsense about Nero fiddling while Rome burned, but the point about Rome burning is it really burned. This is the extent of the damage. And the reason why this happens is that Rome is built of structures like this. The housing in Rome is dealing with popula average population densities of 300 to 500 persons per hectare. In multi-storey buildings, <coughs> of which this is a very charming, clean and lifeless representation. This is Alan Sorrell's representation of what it actually looked like. When this stuff burns, there is nothing to stop it. It's extremely difficult. Japanese cities in the pre-modern world had exactly the same problem. They would go up like a bomb. 
two thirds of the city would burn and significant numbers of people would die. This is my favorite image of the burning of Imperial Rome. That's actually the Chicago fire. That's actually Chicago, but it looks like multi-story tenements in Rome. I quite like that picture. <coughs> Cities in themselves generate risk for humans simply because of their physical form. The materiality is actually not in synchrony and not serving the social system that is in it. It is capable of killing enormous numbers of people. So if you then look on an even larger scale, a greater time scale, at the histories of imperial capital cities, this is a great example of China, this is the Song Dynasty capital, or at least the centre of the Song Dynasty capital. So we're looking at places with areas anywhere from about 5 square k, early Mesopotamia, through to the gigantic cities of China, like Chang'an, about 100 square k in extent, and a really extraordinary example in Mesopotamia in the Abbasid period called Samara, which actually covered 200 square k both sides of the room. And if you plot the durations of those cities, you get a very interesting pattern. You get this sloping survival surface. The bigger a city becomes in area, the shorter its duration. So this is Chang'an, somewhere here, 100 square k. This is Samara. Samara existed, its total existence was 55 years, half of which, 25 years, it was a battlefield divided between two armies. This was an unoperable place. The key point to notice is this slope, but then this pool underneath. Now if you look at this in terms of archaeological theory, in terms of a contextualist or post-processualist view in archaeology where you have unique histories. That is what that diagram should look like. There should be no pattern at all. Everything should be uniquely contextual. If you were a strict processualist, it should look like that. Everything should be on one trend. In other words, there should be no options in the pure processualist, and there should be every option in the contextualist. <coughs> what we actually see is really interesting. There is a processualist edge, but below that edge, all histories are contextual and unique. So one of the things we need to do in archaeology is get out of dualistic obsessions about processualist opposed to post-processual or whatever. That's beginning to fade away in archaeology. Everybody's just cherry-picking whichever bit they happen to want. But the reason why we can do that and it makes sense is that there are big boundary conditions in cultural behavior. But almost all of the histories are unique and idiosyncratic. This one down here, for instance, is a Japanese capital which was built and after nine years, the ruler said he didn't like it, and he left and moved up the valley and built Kyoto. It's a Japanese example. It could, on the one hand, be considered that this is simply the will of the emperor. It could, on the other, be argued that they put the place in a really stupid location and tended to get very wet. But it lasted for nine years. But that's not the same as whatever this is, or this is, or this is. So unique history and big pattern go together. But this here is a material boundary, because this is the limit beyond which these settlements cannot sustain themselves at these particular sizes. It, size, the magnitude becomes unworkable. So then as we go to a global scale, I'm going to jump through these very quickly. 
this is where archaeology really has to adjust its view up to very large scales, is we confront in modern world material threat at a global biological scale. So first of all from nuclear weapons. We cannot get nuclear weapons out of our system and they are a permanent deadly threat to us. They would be a planetary deadly threat to us if warfare broke out. If you ever get the chance, go on Google Earth and look at the testing ground in Nevada. That is where the big weapons tests were done. Each of these is a crater from a nuclear weapons test. There are hundreds of them. It's all pretty fixing. If there was a nuclear war, that is what would happen to us. Those are the radiation levels that would result. We would be very dead. Australia might just get away with it. But I'm sure somebody would be sufficiently narky about that that they'd lob one in our direction in order to stop that little mark going. The New Zealanders, nobody cares about New Zealand. They might just get away with it. But we're all in deep trouble. And we live with that threat all the time. We created it, we made that system, and we cannot get away from it. The other is, of course, global warming and plastics. Global warming, which we can see occurring very clearly in any statistical description, is a function of this. It is actually the material waste products of the Industrial Revolution pumped into the planetary system which are causing our problem. This is a materiality problem. It's not a social problem in the sense of the way we deal with it. We created this problem in the first place and all that derivative, all that waste we thought we could forget about. The product served our social system, but the waste does not. The waste is not in correspondence with our sociality at all. We are generating staggering levels of emissions. This is what we've done to our global temperature in relation to carbon dioxide. You can look at this in terms of any number of indices which are going on. This is why the Anthropocene has now been defined, because we can actually see the chemical markers of human beings in the natural world. And of course, we've now become acutely aware of this problem, which is that plastics appear to serve our society. But we're now in a circumstance where plastics are a major pollutant. And we have several areas of the world <coughs> marked up here in pink where huge concentrations of plastics are occurring, floating on the surface in the oceans. We may be able to hoover those up, but they constitute an enormous problem. So as you go up the scale, the materiality risk gets greater. The final point I want to make is that if you look at our behaviour on an evolutionary scale, the significance of stone tools becomes really serious. And interestingly, it doesn't become really serious because of the use of the tool for the purpose that the users made it. They probably made it to smash bone, shave wood. It's what they actually generated as a waste product that is significant. What we generated making stone tools was trash. Huge quantities of stone trash making occupation sites. We wouldn't have any archaeology if they didn't do that. But this has very serious significance. This is the kind of 
early tools, these are almost nothing more than a piece of rock that's been whacked between six and ten times. You get these kind of features all over the world. By the time you get to 600,000 years ago, you actually get occupational surfaces like this. This is a place I worked at as a student at Zubaydia in Israel. You think, that's a bit weird. Well, the answer is it is a bit weird because that used to be horizontal. It's a horizontal floor that's been tipped up by tectonic action. It's the nicest archaeological site I ever worked on because it's like being an artist cleaning the thing down. It's just wonderful. But that's actually a living floor. And that's just piles of rock. What is really interesting about this is not what the use of the tools are, but that we now, several million years later, can see occupation sites. And the point about that is so could they. The significance of stone tools on an occupation site as distinct from what the chimpanzees do, which is stone tools on a work site, is that this is leaving a signature on the ground for any other observer from then to now. The end result is that what the development of stone tools did was it created a cultural landscape. If you as a hominid walked into a valley and found a scatter of stone tools, you would know they were not your stone tools. That's not the type of stone tool we make. You know instantly when you find a scatter of stone as a hominid that you are in an area where there are other hominids. And you know it very decisively. These are basically territorial markers. So the crucial effect of introducing stone tools into human behavior in occupation sites is the trash. Because it then gives a permanent signal about where people are. And once you know that, that starts accumulating as a selective agent. Any brain which can remember those patterns, remember those configurations, has an enormous advantage over any brain that doesn't. So the selective pressure generated by stone tools is not that you have to be brainy to make stone tools. You don't. You have no more brainy than a chimpanzee to make stone tools. It is only once we made stone tools that the skyrocketing of our brain size begins to occur. And one of the reasons for that is that you have to process an enormous amount of spatial information because this is vital. This tells you where other hominids are without seeing them, without ever meeting them, without ever engaging with them. And when you get fire, for instance, once humans are using fire, that territorial scale expands enormously. You can see where people are a dozen kilometers away. You know to avoid them, or you want to approach them. But your brain has got to process that geographical information. So the formation of materiality of human beings is very significant. It suggests that there is a very powerful visual component of this behavior, and that is indicated by a very curious phenomenon which you may never have heard of called gigantoliths. These are very weird. You can see how these are hand axes. You can scarcely lift this damn thing. They are found scattered on the landscape all over the area where hand axes occur. They appear simply to be the making of a highly visible form. These don't have a use. A hand axe that you can carry in your hand has a use in terms of a tool. 
these appear to be part of a visual construction. They're actually articulating visuality. These have never been properly studied. Everybody thinks, oh, it's just really weird. Well, it is, it's really weird. But that's a really interesting problem because the pattern of those, where they occur, the time spans over which they occur, points at which they cease to occur, begin to be critical. So just to wrap up, we have a relationship between materiality and sociality that is very adverse at very large scales. And when you get down to the very small scale, you get the engagement and association.